Hello, thank you for having tuned into ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, and we're broadcasting live here, and after that, YouTube forever, from our oceanic capital city of Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, as the nature of the show is architecture, and architecture is usually uh, considered to be connected with, with land, and uh, Hawaiians here call the land uh, the Aina, and they mean this literally and figuratively and comprehensively. So um, in, in these days, we might have forgotten a little bit about what surrounds us and why I said the capital, the, the world's capital, is that we're surrounded by the most water masses in the world. So we're the most remote place from other land masses, but we're the most in most water. And so um, we want to reflect on what surrounds us and how this could have a relationship to architecture. In, in order to do so, we're going to bring in an expert, and she has placed herself strategically in the middle of all the landmass, and we're broadcasting live uh, to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and it's uh, 10 p.m. there now, so we're five hours time difference, and who's going to be our guest and educate us about the uh, oceanic and the sea is an architect and a graphic artist and a scholar uh, and last but not at all least, uh, an educator. And her name is uh, Lisa Kim. Lisa, thank you for being with us on the show. Hi, Martin. Thank you for having me. Uh, good to have you. And uh, we met uh, a little while ago when you were visiting us and gave a fantastic presentation that ever since resonates with me whenever I'm in touch with the water which I'm basically every day, and I prepare myself for the show today with my daily diving and swimming, and I went under the water, and you, as if it was meant to be, the weather was clear down there, and I had, I had a view of the things you're going to talk about. But uh, this is your show, so please tell us, and we're going to bring in picture number one for that, to share with us um, why you're so connected to water, and I'm going to start off and share one thing that you're uh, both of us are genetically connected to water uh, me in germany we have the north sea and your ancestry is korean right mm -hmm. but what we see is not korea so where is that and what does it have to do with your very strong from my point of view very unique connectivity to the oceanic in your very sort of poetically pragmatic and pragmatically poetic way so where do you come from well, so the image that you see there is of the Sutro Baths, which are in San Francisco, um, which is where I spent a lot of time as a kid. Um, I kind of grew up in that area. And I really like that image um, because I think for me it configures both a sort of um, idea of containment, but also of escape, mm -hmm. um, which I think are ideas that we often project onto the space of the ocean. Um, and what I'm really interested in is trying to understand how we can think about a relationship between culture and nature that's maybe a little bit different um, than what we typically think of in the sense that we, we tend to draw lines between those two entities. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of interested in understanding how we can actually blur those lines. Yeah. And this is a fantastic opening statement because this is what happened to us here in Hawaii that we look at water almost like a commodification, a commodity where it's whenever we build real estate on the land, water is sort of the backdrop. It's about views and it's about prime coastal uh, property and real estate and looking at the water and having it as, you know, background for, for postcards. But um, that's, that's sort of this surfacial view of the ocean, and you have a very uh, substantial view of the ocean. And when you were just saying drawing a line, it uh, made me smile uh, because uh, your means and methods are actually drawing lines in a very fascinating way. And we're going to bring in number two, picture number two, which is your way of illustrating how actually we're conventionally looking at the oceans and the sea, right? Yeah, exactly. It's I mean, I think anybody can kind of relate to that image as the sort of typical political map of the world. 
Um, but what I think is interesting is that that's still the way that we tend to draw the ocean. So the ocean in that image is really represented by this gridded space, which is one way of thinking about it as a mathematical space, which then can also be extrapolated as a sort of abstract space. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's as if the ocean sort of disappears and it's really the sort of named and terrestrial bodies that are emerging out of that sort of flat yeah. sphere. Fascinating. And the, the true scholar you are, uh, you did your, your research, um, your precedent study research, how we always encourage our students to do at the very beginning, and to say the best ideas, you know, are probably not the ones you come up with, but there have been other ones, pioneers in the area. So you found another female researcher who uh, did some pioneering work in that and gets us to the next picture. You want to talk about her, please? Yeah, so Marie Tharp um, is actually kind of one of the uh, figures that inspired a lot of the work that I've been doing. She was um, actually the first cartographer to draw the ocean floor and to map the ocean floor. Um, and this was during the Cold War where um, it was sort of in the national interest in terms of security and defense to understand the topography of the floor. Um, and as a woman, she wasn't actually allowed to um, participate in any of the expeditions. So she was back in the labs in Colombia, um, really translating a lot of the sonar data that was coming from the expedition ships into these kind of beautiful um, hand-rendered drawings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's great. You give her justice and rehabilitate her. It reminds me of the recent movie about... Uh the black woman behind shooting people to the moon, right? So exactly. finally it all comes out that right. there's a lot of woman power behind all that, the great things. <laughs> so yeah. talking about progression and evolution of that research, 20 years later is the next uh, uh, beautiful drawing here. Explain to us what that is. Yeah, so that's essentially um, a sectional di uh, diagram of the ocean. Um, it starts to talk about the delineation of the ocean after the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the framework that starts to give jurisdiction to different sovereign states um, mm. and, and really just kind of tries to start to organize the space of the oceans a little bit more through legislature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's amazing because these are, you make something invisible visible right because when when I swim in the morning on a very small scale you know I don't I don't see what I see is the natural boundaries where the reef is and where the reef ends you know that I see and I can feel but these are sort of invisible I mean they're human uh, you said before the show terrestrial markations yeah. right 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 and so uh, so let's go to number five, which where it, where it starts, that you sort of, in your beautiful diagrammatic way, make clear um, to us how things are. So this is a, what we call a figure of ground uh, illustration. What does it show? Yeah, so typically we're used to, in architecture, drawing um, the buildings as the sort of um, black uh, space or figure, um, and here I'm I'm trying to reverse that. So I'm I'm really trying to draw the ocean as the figure as opposed to the void. Um, but it's still in this image kind of devoid of any additional information. So in some ways, it, it's very similar to the political map that we showed in image two, um, where we're really kind of just understanding the flat sort of surface mm -hmm. of the ocean. Yeah. And the next picture is subtitled with a beautiful name that I will do my best not to mispronounce. That's bathymetric. What the, is bathymetric? Yeah, well, bathymetry um, is the is the word, but it's a bathymet bathymetric atlas of the sea. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and essentially, so here, what I'm trying to do is, and and kind of going back to some of Marie Tharp's drawings to really draw the topography of the ocean floor beneath the water mm -hmm. um, and again really kind of trying to blur some of the boundaries between what we would consider to be land and what we would consider to be water mm -hmm. and so here you kind of see a smoother uh, more fluid transition between those two bodies mm -hmm. and the next two pictures are zoomed in right in, in, in certain cultural uh, jurisdictional kind of zones and and this right. is also the, the background picture that that studio chose and uh, color coded it a little bit more but uh, 
these are really sort of carefully crafted and, and you know, in your capacity of both an architect and, and a graphic artist, sort of um, really tools uh, for, for comprehending the, uh, the otherwise invisible. And um, if, if we go to number nine, um, this again gets us back to, uh, to zone. I mean, we call this zoning, right, on land. And how do you call that on water? And what are these? Well, so what you see there are 177 new um, sovereign claims. So it's essentially 177 um, claims to territory under the surface of the ocean and, and kind of along the ocean floor. Um, it's essentially the first new sort of land grab by multiple countries that we've seen in, in kind of modern time mm -hmm. at, at, at that particular scale. Mm -hmm. So it, traditionally also in, in education and in practice, we call this diagramming, right? You really bring out certain aspects of, of, of a thing by emphasizing it through particular focus on certain lines and, and volumes and, 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 and shapes. And so uh, the next one, number 10, is, is once again demonstrating something very graphically compelling and, and intriguing that is so something very, it's a very soft uh, uh, illustration for a very hard thing which has to do with money, right? Yeah, so um, that slide, you're looking at the exclusive economic zones, um, and those are essentially, those were delineated um, in the original um, Convention on the Law of the Sea. So they basically say that along any nation's coast, mm -hmm. um, 200 nautical miles out from that coast um, remains the jurisdiction of that particular country. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess what makes the, the sort of diagrams from the previous slide really important is that this is the first time that we're essentially claiming other parts of the ocean. And, and the reason that this was actually sort of allowed to happen was for the purpose of um, exploitation of natural resources. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this is really a, a, a sort of an imperialist map, right? Exactly. Conquering, mm -hmm. which we're very familiar to here in, in Hawaii. And so go, go back to this interesting term that you bring in, which is claims, because that has to do, once again, with the next slide as well, number 11. Yeah, so um, what you see on that slide are just kind of zooming in on three of the particular claims. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can imagine, you know, I think it's, it's interesting, especially today when there's been so much focus in the public realm on this idea of, of kind of securing our borders and whether our borders are really protected from immigration or not, to then kind of step back and realize that our borders actually extend far beyond what we can see um, kind of with our own eyes mm -hmm. and that our, our sort of countries take on a much different shape than we're accustomed to, I think is, um, is particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. Super fascinating. At this point, we're going to take a chance to take a one-minute commercial break, promotional break for our colleague's show, and then we're going to be back with uh, Elisa Kim's exciting narrative about the oceanic. So, see you in a minute. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to youtube.com, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Live. Aloha, I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship uh, between boards and their residents. Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha. We hope you'll tune in. 
So we're back to Elisa Kim's uh, Oceanic Realm, and we've been talking about borders as a very unfortunate current issue in, in the world these days. And so the, the next uh, beautiful um, diagram, number 12, is uh, dedicated to that, right? Yeah, so that, um, that drawing collapses the new claims um, that I was talking about with this sort of um, current geopolitical map. Um, and so it's really kind of thought of as a, as a new atlas um, in 2016. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the next one gets us a little bit more maybe to architectural. I mean, not saying that this is not architectural, but this is especially intriguing. And I also want to point out to my dear friend and mentor, Chris Ford, who is a strong advocate of eidetic images and composite drawings. And I'll take a chance to say how, again, how beautifully crafted these things are in a truly modern sense, because you can extract all this information that you know used to build them up but could you can also you look at them in in just a way of of composition and, and find them really wonderfully balanced and composed and crafted and and the background between uh, this picture here when we were talking uh, before reminds me of my childhood proximity to the to the to the coast because in northern germany where i'm from we have a national park it's called wattenmeer and that's where the sea uh, over half of a day retracts, so you can actually walk on the bottom of the sea uh, for hours. And then you got to, we talked about that certain landscapes sort of temporarily appear. There are priels, which are little rivers. That's, these are the ones where the water goes out as the last and comes back in as the first. So I have some connectivity to that. And so you, once again, um, were, were, were illustrating that and, and, and analyzing that with your uh, fascinating tool. So let us know what, uh, and it's once again introducing uh, uh, an intriguing word and term that's hydrographia. Hopefully I got that set well. Yeah, and right. yeah. so there, um, hydro is from the Greek uh, water and graphia is also from the Greek, it means writing. So mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this as a sort of a type of water writing. Mm -hmm. um, and a sort of communicative mapping that tries to both um, collapse the new territories and um, bathymetric contours of the ocean floor with an additional temporal dimension that's really inherent to the materiality of and, and perhaps the sort of um, events that only occur at the surface of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of those lines that you see and the and the kind of stippling actually relied on a real-time collection of data um, where I was tracking vessels and other sort of floating populations mm -hmm. um, to hint at a sort of not just um, the top or the bottom surface of the ocean, but this idea that it's a sort of volumetric space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a form, it's a three-dimensional form, right? That's sort of, you know, you, you can't uh, comprehend it traditionally and conventionally, right? So you got to go through this sort of intellectual twist in your mind that this drawing is sort of a, a vehicle for, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and along these lines, the next one is, is titled The Ocean Inside Out. This is actually pushing this to an even more extreme, right? Yeah, um, so these were actually inspired by some drawings um, from the 1600s um, that depicted the world without water. And they, they, the globes kind of looked like these shriveled up raisins. Um, and so I wanted to sort of try to reverse our normalized perceptions of the sea by, you know, um, depicting the oceans not as voids, but actually as figures. Mm -hmm. So here I've kind of um, extruded the space of the ocean out. Um, so you can see the oceans sort of emerging from the sort of void of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the closest we get here is that, you know, when we explain Mauna Kea to people, we say it's actually the largest mountain in the world if you measure it from the bottom of the, of the ocean, right? And just I from the, the above the water line, it's not. There are other ones who are taller. So, so that's the closest we get to it, but then usually we don't think further. So you, through these compelling sort of, um, you know, gymnastics of, 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 of thinking about it, make us really um, uh, see that. 
So when I was introducing you in these different capacities and um, being an, 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 a graphic artist and an architect, and um, obviously this being your scholarly work, but you pass this on to the uh, to the next emerging generation uh, in your role as as an educator, and I have to say that the school you're you're at right now is um, is uh, Washington University, and um, it's one of the most prestigious schools in the country. And we have uh, someone that relates us. That's Robert McCarter. So I will say hi to Robert. He's one of my dear mentors, and so um, we will send him a link to the show. So. Um, so yeah, again, um, share with us now in the remaining time in the show um, how you get students excited uh, about your methodology and how they apply that to, uh, to the discipline of uh, to architecture. Mm -hmm. So the next picture is 16, please. So yeah, these, um, this was a studio that I actually co-taught um, with Igor Marjanovic, who's the chair um, of the undergraduate program at WashU, and it took place in Florence, Italy. Um, we were there with the students for eight weeks, and um, we asked the students to envision a possible tenth island. There are nine islands in the Tuscan archipelago. Mm -hmm. um, and we asked them to envision a transient space for world immigrants. Um, in Florence, the sort of migrant crisis is really apparent, and I think it's um, something that the students aren't able to necessarily avoid. And so we wanted them to start to think about space um, through the eyes of, of some migrants. And I, I should say that it's, um, you know, I think we think of these projects as academic exercises, potentially more as rhetorical devices to bring some of these important issues um, to the fore, rather than to kind of think of this as a literal solution to mm. a, problem, a, an issue. Problem solving, you mean, versus right. problem, mere problem solving, right? Right. They're really uh, vehicles for thinking, yeah. And, exactly. and again, they. Um, if we get the next picture, um, here, um, you're, uh, this is a perfect demonstration out of the textbook for what Chris Ford calls the eidetic image, and obviously also a composite drawing, which is carefully crafted and built up with data, so you don't come from the artistic approach, you come from a scientific approach, data-based, fact-based, and then basically built this, built this up, built the argument up, and built the drawing up, right? Is that fair to describe, sort of the way of working? Yeah, you know, I think, so this project, um, the student's name is Aria, and she was really inspired by the sort of political undertones surrounding race and gender that function to sort of um, disrupt a migrant's journey for freedom mm -hmm. um, or for a better life. And so she actually used, um, you can see in the image, um, she used imagery from photographer Carrie Mae Weems, um, who has a self-portrait series in which she um, confronts and disrupts famous uh, European architectural iconography by inserting herself in places where black bodies have historically been excluded from. Mm -hmm. And so um, Aria wanted to really make visible the experience of women along migrant routes, um, which is also um, often invisible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You were obviously looking ahead of time because by the time you did this, which was a little while ago, right, things hadn't escalated uh, on an nation, international stage as much as we have it now, right? So this is really timely, uh, timely matter, right? Uh, with yeah, I mean, this actually, we, um, this was just this past summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah. I would say maybe in the midst of, of the sort of escalation. Of all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the next uh, pr picture here, um, project? Yeah, so this is um, the second part of Aria's project, so the same student. Um, and she actually was researching some of the personal stories of the women migrants. Um, and she learned that actually the women felt much more vulnerable um, when they were inside of a refugee camp as opposed to kind of in transit. And so it inspired her to um, 
develop or sort of envision the island as a transient home for women and children as they await asylum. Mm -hmm. um, she used as a sort of a tectonic or as a sort of um, material and structural logic the idea of the veil, which uh, many of the women spoke of as being um, something that they felt protected mm -hmm. while wearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a very um, ephemeral approach, right? It's a very, very loose approach. It's a very area approach, right? So it's not about containing and confinement, you know, and causing more stress. It's about releasing that stress, right? And, and mitigating, right. Uh, which is, you know, very important. So number uh, next picture, second to last, is is once again the, the great ability to zoom in and out. So that one was really zooming in into the architectural fabric, literally and figuratively speaking. But we're going to number nineteen. You're going to zoom out again and have a more macro approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, this is a project by a student named Lele who um, really kind of. Um, was taking stock of the stories um, that were being reported on of the sort of deaths that were occurring in the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. And so this first image is a drawing where she's kind of really trying to understand the scale of what was happening. Yeah, yeah. And once again, beautifully crafted. Um, while we show the last picture, we're running out of time, uh, so we probably don't have time to go into detail, but I want to sort of uh, conclude and phase out in, in, in thanking you for um, educating us and, and giving us um, sort of inspiration about our very specific place here uh, in Hawaii where, um, you know, people having lived here before having been discovered um, were, um, I, I believe, allow myself to say, and who am I? I'm a Hali, I'm not from here, but I feel that they must have been thinking about this uh, not very differently. In, in a way that they try to understand things intellectually, but also were very much sort of intuitively connected to things and were trying to, to match the two uh, together and, and blend it. And there's some of the artifacts of navigating with, you know, with sticks and bones and things like that. All very, you know, you know, pragmatical and research tools, uh, but at the same time also inherently a poetic in, in their nature of not having been designed uh, superficially, surfacially, but really kind of substantially. So I think, uh, needless to say, we need you here. So uh, hopefully we can get you here at some point in one way or another. And uh, thanks for that little appetizer, uh, which is much appreciated. And uh, well, thank you for staying up so late uh, back in the heartland. And yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for enlightening us. <laughs> <laughs>